and we're live. Hi everyone, I'm Petrina from the APDT and welcome to another instalment of Train Your Dog Month. Tonight I'm joined by Faye Moffat Roberts and I may apologise to her and apologise to anyone else who's listening because I said the wrong name yesterday so I'm sorry about that. Welcome Faye, hi, nice to see hi. you. <laughs> Thank you for welcoming me and I'm hoping that my presentation will be really helpful for everyone. Um, and there's an opportunity to ask some questions at the end. So um, I hope you enjoy it. Great, perfect. Um, we've already got a little thumbs up. If you've got any questions, do pop them in the chat and Faye will come to them at the end. Um, there's lots to learn about deaf dogs. So I hope you're going to enjoy this one. If you're all right, we'll start the presentation, Faye. Yeah, no, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining me, Faye Moffat Roberts on how to train deaf dogs. I'm a qualified dog trainer with APDT and I run puppy and older dog classes as well as one-to-one -one sessions for both deaf dogs and hearing dogs. In the picture, can you tell which dog is deaf? Did you get it right? How did you know? So, our deaf dogs look exactly the same as any other dogs and unless someone told you, no one would think that they were any different. And they're not. They are invisible disability, but it does not affect the way they live their lives or affect their understanding to training. Here is what we're going to cover today. Causes deafness. Is my dog deaf? My dog is deaf. Now what? Types of equipment and what you are really wanting to know how to train your deaf dog. So we will be explaining choice training, how to mark the behaviour, examples of cues to ask for a specific behaviour, about reinforcing the behaviour, some training games and please wait until the end for my very own special offer. There are many causes of deafness. The most common in Dalmatians is hereditary and congenital, meaning that it is passed on from their parents and present at birth. Many people are aware that Dalmatians are prone to deafness. However, there are many other breeds that suffer from deafness and it's probably more common than you think. Deafness has been recognised for centuries and is understood to be linked to the white coat gene. The most common being piebald black and white and male colours. Causes of deafness can arise from damage, i.e. physical trauma from an injury or infection, whether viral or bacterial. Dogs who constantly suffer from ear infections can be more prone and even some medications have been known to cause deafness. If deafness comes on suddenly or unexpectedly, then obviously check with your vet to ensure that everything is okay with your beautiful dog. As dogs get older, their hearing can be affected and tends to be more of a gradual change. Deafness can be either unilateral, deaf in one ear, or bilateral, deaf in both ears. Dogs who are unilaterally deaf may tilt their heads to one side or have difficulty pinpointing exactly where a sound came from. Indications that your dog may be deaf. Every dog is different in temperament and character, so some dogs it may be obvious that they are deaf, compared to others who are very acute responding to what appears to be a specific sound. They may have little or no response to their name, Squeaky toys, dogs barking, doorbells, food wrappers, sudden noises, the list is endless. When I visited Ollie and then brought him home, I was unaware that he was deaf. There were times when I thought he was and then other times I was like, is he? Isn't he? He came to stay with us at 50 months old and was adjusting into his new life. For example, I would go into the kitchen, Ollie remained in the living room, I opened the cupboard, got a packet of crisps, the packet rustled, no sign of the dog. I opened the packet, took out a crisp, ping, the dog appears. So how do you know if your dog is deaf? We're unable to see the disability. There are a few simple things that we can try to see if our dogs respond. However, these are not as reliable as you think. We could try clapping, banging, rustling a wrapper, whistling, speaking softly. We can try many things. We can then observe the dog. Did they respond? Was that a flick of an eye or an ear? Or maybe they moved completely. Did they hear? Or didn't they? Did they use one of their other senses? Just if they move their head slightly. They may have some movement elsewhere that caught their attention. If you moved and disrupted the air movement, e.g. clapping or moving a door, then this will cause changes in air movement. Think of a wagging tail and how drafty that can be. Were they able to smell the changes? Rustling food packaging or even changing air movement can create scent particles that they may have detected. Your behaviour. Did you send any signals to them? As you conducted the test, did you act any differently, e.g. your body language or emotions? 
Did your heart or respiration rate change? Is it learnt behaviour when you leave the room, exciting things happen and so they join you? Or just simple curiosity, where did you go? What are you doing? Did you make it easy for them to cheat? It is important, therefore, to observe the whole situation and assess every tiny detail and repeat on numerous occasions. The best tests are the ones that are unexpected and these tend to provide more accurate results. Brainstem Auditory Evoked Response or Bear Testing. This is conducted by a specialist vet. It is not cheap, so please assess whether it is needed. Obviously, if you are breeding and want to sell the puppies, then it is in your best interest for your client and your reputation to ensure that the doctor sold is advertised. Brainstem Auditory Evoked Response is non-invasive, quick and painless, although your vet will anaesthetise the dog to make the monitoring easier rather than contending with an excitable or nervous dog as a dog needs to remain still and quiet during the entire test. It measures the brain response to auditory sounds which are displayed onto a graph. The peaks indicate that the brain registered the sound, whereas if no peak appears, then there was no response to the sound. The test can take between 5 to 50 minutes and you should receive a certificate from your vet after conducting a bear test. So, on to the important stuff, how to train a deaf dog. So, we will be looking at difficulties with training, safety, equipment, what is choice training, marking the behaviour, examples of visual cues, rewards, and most importantly, some training you can do with your dog. So, how difficult is for training dogs? Whether you know that your dog is deaf, or you have a suspicion that they could be, deaf dogs can actually be trained, and to be honest, they're probably easier to train than hearing dogs. If you have built up a strong enough relationship together, as they will always be looking to you for information, reassurance and guidance. They will definitely want to know exactly where you are. There is nothing intellectually wrong with your dog and everyone encounters difficulty with their training at some point. This is normal and how we learn. So if this occurs, re-evaluate the situation and see what may have been the issue, address it and try again. It can be the most minute or simple tweak needed and all of a sudden everything falls into place. Don't be afraid to ask for some help or some advice. We all have off days, including our dogs, so if it's not working, leave it for the time being and try again later. It could be as simple that your dog just needs time to think about it. People have suggested that a hearing dog living with your deaf dog can help with training. I've not tried this and to be honest, I'm not sure that it's actually necessary. One-to-one -one training with any dog is essential if you want to build up that all-important strong relationship together. Those of you with two or more dogs, what habits do they copy? For example, the doorbell rings and the postman arrives, the dog vocally rushes to the front door. Being deaf, my dogs are nice and quiet when anybody arrives. Safety aspects. This is extremely important, and no matter what activities you and your dog are doing, safety should always be considered, regardless of them being deaf or not. You are now your dog's ears. Owning a deaf dog, I found my awareness of my surroundings increased as I was listening for potential things that my dog would not be able to notice. For example, dogs, animals, children, bicycles, horse riders, joggers, anything else approaching. Remember, these other animals and people are not expecting your dog to be deaf, as they don't know otherwise. The last thing you want is for your dog to be taken by surprise, pounced on from another dog or child, or knocked by a moving bicycle, so like any parent, you are ensuring safety at all times. Warning signs from other dogs or animals. Sometimes our dogs can become over aroused, stimulated and do not take any notice of the warning body language that others may be expressing. All these signs have become ignored and so they are more verbal. A low growl, for example. In these situations, it is important therefore to prevent anything from escalating further by allowing space and consideration. Management is the best thing to prevent anything untoward from happening. This could be simply as putting a lead on, placing it into their crate, keeping things out of reach. The list is endless and forever changing depending on the circumstances and the situation. Vibration collars. Personally, I've not felt the need to use these devices for many reasons. They can be mistaken for electric collars, whether someone thinks you were using them or you purchased one by mistake. They are big, bulky, heavy and not generally available in different sizes. So if you have a small dog, I'm not sure they would be suitable. What happens if your dog likes water and they get wet? What happens if your dog is out of range? What happens if the collar comes off or gets caught on something? There is usually a delay from pressing the button and then the signal being sent to the vibrate. Some dogs may find the sensation unpleasant or do not take any notice of the vibration at all, especially if they have a really thick coat. So, what do we mean by choice training? 
How lovely would it be that our dogs could know exactly what it is that we want rather than constantly nagging at them? Will you sit? Will you wait there? Will you stop pulling? Etc. etc. I'm cooking dinner. Where's my dog? Oh, he's laid down on the floor. Good choice. By allowing our dogs to choose and work things out for themselves can help build confidence and the ability to learn more effectively as they're thinking for themselves rather than being spoon fed all the time where they are unable to think or are being constantly nagged at. By working things out for themselves can actually speed up the training process. This improves brain activity and a healthy cognitive function, preventing the onset of dementia and increases problem solving. When I'm out about with my dogs, I come across many of the dog owners surprised that my dogs are off lead. How do they know which one I'm calling? Ollie, Holly, they sound very similar. If they wander off, how do I get them back? Training, of course. I was out walking Ollie and I came across somebody and stopped to talk to them. Ollie decided to go ahead of me into the wooded area and disappear from sight. The person who was talking to me was very anxious that my dog had disappeared and how on earth was I going to get him back? I said, don't worry, give him a few seconds and he'll be back. The person looked at me shocked. Then out pops Ollie from the woods looking to see where I, why I wasn't with him and came trundling back to me. His choice to come back, he didn't need any persuasion. Training. It's all about having fun. If things are fun to do, we enjoy the experience and are more willing to participate. Why do we own dogs? For companionship, showing activities, having fun, keeping fit. Therefore, building a strong and happy relationship together is so important for everyone. Individual training. This is so important as we're wanting a relationship together, working with us and not against us. If we work with our dog individually, we can give them the time and undivided attention to help them flourish in their learning. If we are distracted or unable to commit to their learning, then their behaviour is more likely to deteriorate. Keep training sessions really short, 30 seconds initially. These can then be built up to about two minutes, no longer for each exercise. Avert breaks and waiting for the kettle to boil are ideal times to train your dog. And the best thing is you do not need to time them exactly as you can use how long the advert lasts or how long it takes for the kettle to boil. If the kettle is on as often as it is in my house, you will have your dog trained in no time. Or you can just have a handful of about 10 treats and once they have run out, training session ends. Always end a training session when your dog wants more. They're more likely to work harder the next time. Otherwise, it's, oh my God, we're not still playing this. Do not be tempted to train for longer, especially when things are going wrong, because this can actually be detrimental to your training. For example, the dog may become bored, confused or frustrated, creating a vicious circle between you and your dog. If your dog does not understand, please do not get frustrated. Just leave it for that day and try again another time. It may be that they just need some time to process the information that you are asking. So what do we need for successful training? Peckable timing, exactly when the dog does the right thing, we need to mark it, which we'll come on to in a minute. Are you some thumbs up? Rewards, you need to obviously let them know that what they did was great and here's your prize. Clear instructions, I tend to use one hand signals as they are easier. Cues, only added when the dog understands what they are doing. This is introduced as the dog is moving into the position for example, as the dog's bottom starts to move towards the floor, the cue word, signal, sit, is said, used. Breaks. Like us, our dogs need plenty of breaks to help them have fun and process information, especially if they are young dogs or doing something new for the first time. Training sessions can be broken up by having a short game of tug or allowing them to choose what they would like to do, relax, sniff, have a drink, etc. If you or your dog are tired, then do not train as we are all unable to absorb the information and so learning becomes difficult and ineffective, leading to confusion and frustration. By marking the behaviour, we're informing our dogs that they are correct and that is what we wanted them to do. For example, if we had a spelling test and we got an elephant correct, we would get a tick, a mark. If we got it wrong, then it would get a cross next to the word. However, was the spelling completely wrong? Did we write giraffe instead? Of course not. We may have put a double L or put an E instead of an A. Could someone reading the words still know what we were referring to? An elephant. All we need is some help or guidance to learn how to spell elephant correctly. Our dogs are no different. They just need to help to understand what it is we would like them to do. By not observing the mark, they soon work out that they didn't choose correctly and will generally choose a different behaviour instead. The mark I use for my dogs is a thumbs up. It's really catchy, even my dog training friends slip into the habit of using it when they have been working with my dogs. However, you can use any type of hand signal that you want to. 
The timing is really important because we can easily mark the incorrect behaviour or even miss the opportunity if our dogs are faster than us. I struggled with my timing for marking Holly. She was super fast at do, looking at me and then looking away. Just for a split second, meaning I kept missing the opportunity. So I persevered and concentrated more. And probably one in every five I managed to mark. She quickly learned that when she allowed me to mark her looking at me, she got a treat. And so she started to give longer eye contact as her confidence and understanding grew. The duration of the signal is important and only needs to be visible enough for the dogs to see. So no longer than a second should be sufficient. Our dogs would have seen it and if we leave the sign there any longer it just becomes meaningless as the dog is still not done as we have asked. It could also add unnecessary pressure and our dogs become overwhelmed or our dogs just need to think about what it is we have asked them to do so we allow them the time and the opportunity to do so. Being consistent is also important in helping our dogs to understand, otherwise this can lead to confusion and frustration. However, with visual cues, i.e. your marker and cue signals, this can be difficult as we are unable to rely on the precision every time. What if you have something in your hand, like some cutlery, wearing gloves, or a different positional angle? The shape of a thumbs up is the same, however the appearance would be slightly different, as there could be a spoon in your hand. Blue gloves on, so the colour and texture have changed. We therefore need to allow our dogs to understand that the information is still the same. So the more we use our cues in different situations, the more generalised these will become. If you are familiar with using a clicker or a verbal marker word, for example, yes, good, nice, then the principles are exactly the same. We are just using a visual marker rather than a verbal one or sound. And signals. This is very much personal preference. As I said, I use a thumbs up for marking my dogs as I find it simple, clear and easy to make. It allows me to still have items in my hand and I'm, I am unlikely to drop them. Why hands? Easy to make very different shapes. You could nod your head or touch different parts of your body. However, these can be limiting. Close to the dog, so easy for them to see. Dogs learn very quickly to watch your hands as they, they generally contain exciting things. Toys and food, for example. Tactile cues. I do use a couple of tactile cues, however your dog should be comfortable with being touched and unlikely to freak out from the rude invitation. For example, if you would like Holly to move off the sofa, I will give her a light double pat on her side. I will give a little tickle on her haunches if they are on the lead and ahead of me to gain their attention. They may have seen a bird, another dog or person up ahead. I will also squeeze a lead if they are starting to either pull slightly or disengage. This is just a gentle reminder to say, hi, I'm still here. What do we mean by cues? Some of you may refer to this as commands. However, I would like to think that we are asking our dogs to do something rather than commanding them. Remember that all important relationship that we are wanting to build together. So a cue refers to a question. Would you like to sit? Would you like to stay? I found it difficult to just come up with specific hand signals that came naturally and that worked for both myself and Ollie. Especially if we were in a training class, learning something new and having to think of something in the spirit of the moment. With practice, it does become a lot easier. Keep things simple and unique. One-handed signals are a lot easier, so don't overcomplicate them. You are asking for only one behaviour, so one image is all that is required. Your dog does not need a whole story. As you and your dog become more confident, two-handed signals can be used. If you have an aspiring artist in the family, they could draw all the signs and place them on the fridge door for everyone to refer to. Or, like me, you cannot draw. Then a photo of each cue works just as well. When to add the cue? If we look at sit, my sign is a closed fist with my index finger upright. Our dogs need to understand the behaviour first. Once they understand sit, we can then show them the sign. It is important to add the cue as they do in the behaviour. So for sit, as their bottom is moving towards the floor to enable them to sit, we add the cue. If we're asking for a down, then the cue sign will be added as they are moving into the position of down. Use only once, otherwise you'll just be silent and nagging and your cue signal will just become meaningless. Yep, I can see your hand, but I still have no idea what you want. So it doesn't matter how long you leave it there, your dog may still not respond. Remember, if they are stuck, then we need to help them to understand. If the dog is slow to respond, move your cue and wait to see if the dog works out what it is that they should be doing. Still nothing? Talk to them to keep them interested. This may sound really odd, but this is a natural behaviour for us. And if we are just stood there with no engagement, 
This can actually become overwhelming, intimidating, frustrating or even boring. If nothing, after a few seconds and ask again. Still nothing? Evaluate the situation and see how you can help them to understand. Remember how to achieve successful training. Remember, no longer than about two seconds to show that cue sign and then it disappears. Imagination. This is limitless and a little trial and error can be really helpful. For example, the cue sign I used for stay, Ollie actually stuck two fingers up, well, two toes, and ran off, ran off in the opposite direction. For whatever reason, that cue didn't work for him, and so we now use a different signal. I found that the hand signals and movements used for Ollie were the ones that actually mimicked the behaviour I wanted. For example, his release cue or find it cue, which are coming up in a moment. I have some examples of the cues that I use. Please feel free to have a go at doing these as we go through them and see how each one works and feels for you. So, as you've just heard me briefly explain, this is my sit sign. So it's a closed fist with my index finger pointed upwards. This is my deaf boy Ollie and he's demonstrating sit. So you can see that I put my index finger upright and he offers a sit and then my thumbs up for his marker. This is the sign that I use for down, which looks very similar to my sit sign. And as we explained earlier, we are wanting the sign to look different from one another. When I was learning myself about training deaf dogs, this is something that I hadn't considered or noticed. The sign I used for down actually stems from the training technique used to ask for down. And so this was easier to adopt into a sign rather than trying to change it. Remember, try to keep things simple. My recall sign is a cupped hand gesturing for my dog to return to me. This is the sign that I tried with Ollie for stay, and he stuck two paws at me and ran off. Although it didn't work for Ollie, it doesn't mean that it is not a useful sign that you can use or adapt. The sign that I use for leave it is a flat hand, move one to the side. With my find it cue, this mimics the behaviour that I'm asking Ollie to do. Find it. I place my two fingers to my eye and then move my hand into a downwards motion, and at the same time, open my fingers up as if I'm scattering things onto the floor. This is another of my cues that mimics the behaviour. So my hand is flat, palm facing upwards, and I lift my hand about 10 centimetres in an upward vertical position. I use this cue when Ollie is in a stay position, which then informs him that he has been released and so he can get up from that position. Touch or hand touch. This is really useful to teach with your dogs, and we will discuss the benefits later as part of the training section, where we teach a dog to touch your hand with their nose. We have learned about cues, and marking the correct behaviour, we now need to reward the dog for getting it right. Rewards are important as this helps to reinforce the behaviour, which means that our dogs are more likely to offer the behaviour in the future. It can be easy to think that we know what our dogs find rewarding. However, this can change frequently depending on many factors. Food is generally the easiest reward to use as it is instantaneous, prevents overexcitement, stimulation or overarousal. It can also increase effective training. However, this is not limited, and in other situations, toys, hunting, chasing, running, etc. can be more rewarding than successful. There are different levels of rewards, from, wow, it's okay, to, wow, that was amazing, how do I get some more of that? For example, from normal kibble to supreme meat, if you consider adding a monetary value on food rewards, this can make it easy to understand. So as you can see from boring kibble to squeezy cheese, there is a big difference. The monetary value can be unique to each individual dog and can constantly change, especially if you've been using chicken for the last three days and so it becomes less interesting and the novelty of it being special has decreased. Ah, oh, no, not more chicken. Also, some dogs will work just as hard as being fed boring kibble to wow, it's ham, especially if they are very food orientated like my two are. Size. These need to be small enough for your dog to taste, but not too large for them to make a meal out of them. About the size of a small pea is ideal. If your dog's size is at the smaller or larger end of the scale, then reduce or increase the size accordingly. The timing of the reward is not as important as the timing of the marker. However, it is best to be prepared and always have some to hand, especially when training new things so that you are able to keep your dog's interest. The more training you do, the more patient your dogs will become. And remember, values can constantly change. So if interest is lacking, think about the rewards you are offering. Now on to the fun part. How do we get our dogs to choose to pay attention to us, especially if they're deaf? 
with a very simple and effective ga fun game. It's how the focus game. This is such a lovely game for playing with your dog and they really enjoy playing it. It is also an amazing game for increasing confidence to even the most nervous of our friends. Just a little tweak might be all that's needed. So we are going to place a food treat to the side of your dog, past their nose so that they can see it. As soon as a dog looks in your general direction, mark it with your thumbs up or the marker sign you have chosen. Treat goes on the floor, past your dog's nose, onto the other side. As a dog looks back towards you, mark it, reward and keep repeating. And remember, short sessions, we're looking at 30 seconds initially. The looking at you does not need to be direct eye contact and to hold it there. This can be really intimidating and will come in time when your dog becomes more confident and comfortable looking at you. It can be the slightest head turn or just a slight twitch of an ear, depending on your dog's confidence. You're about to see a short video of my deaf girl Holly playing the focus game to demonstrate the steps that we've just gone through. The next video clip is of my deaf boy Ollie. I wouldn't recommend playing in the long grass as we are wanting the game to be nice, fast and fluid. However, he is a pro at this game. In the long grass, you can see that he missed where some of the treats went. However, he chose to look back at me anyway, which is what the game is all about. Loosely walking. How many of you have dogs who are avid pullers when you are out and about walking? With this information, hopefully we can start to help you change this. Decide initially what side you want your dog to walk on, left or right. If you want to walk them on the left, then you want a handful of treats in your right hand, lead in your right hand, and then one treat ready in your left hand. If you want to walk them on the right hand side, then treats in the lead go into your left hand and one treat ready in your right hand. Touch your leg at the nose height of your dog when the dog's nose is anywhere near the leg you want them to walk on. Mark with your thumbs up and then reward them. Take a step in any direction. This can be either forward, backward, left or right. Just chop and change it as you go along. Touch your leg at nose height. Mark with your thumbs up when the dog's nose is next to your leg and reward them. Please, no giant leaps for mankind. The steps should be in proportion to your dog's size. And remember, when you are stepping away from your dog, no tension on that lead. We're wanting to teach the dogs to be on a nice loose lead and that goes for us humans as well. If your dog becomes a little distracted, then you can try to tickle their side or bottom to regain attention. By touching a leg, we are encouraging the dog to come closer to us rather than their arms reach, push them away from us. And please no luring, we are trying to allow them to work it out. If they are struggling, assess what might be causing the uncertainty. In this video clip, it's Holly demonstrating loosely walking. So this is loosely walking, I want her on my right hand side, so I want leads and my treats on my left hand side. One treat ready, and it doesn't matter where she is, I'm going to touch my leg and offer the treat. And then a step, mark, treat. In this video it's Ollie and he has done a lot more loosely walking and so I do not need to touch my leg or mark him quite as often. 
this is what you are working towards. As you can see, he is walking on my left side, and so my lethal treats are in my right hand. So I mentioned earlier about using a hand touch and the benefits this can have, including regaining focus. If your dog is distracted or struggling with a training activity, then this can help regain concentration. Confidence building. Depending on your dog's own confidence, this can be such a simple exercise that they can easily achieve, especially if they're struggling with a specific training exercise or situation. Recall, by presenting your hand for a hand touch can become more inviting to return to. Greeting people. If someone holds out their hand, then a dog can gently greet them with a hand touch. Moving about. I use this a lot with my dogs and it is a really effective way for asking them to move around the house. For example, coming in or out of a room, just moving slightly as I want to straighten the rug, meaning that you do not need to try and physically move them. How do we teach our dogs to touch a hand with their nose? Place a treat between your ring and middle finger and hold it there. Present your hand to the dog at their level, ensuring that the hand is flat and they can access with their nose. You want to hold your hand a short distance from your dog's nose and hold it still. We do not need to bop them on the nose. We are wanting them to choose to touch it. They will smell the treat and if they are confident, they will try and get the treat at the same time. They will touch your palm with their nose. Mark the nose touching your hand with your thumbs up and then wriggle the reward, i.e. the treat, free from your fingers so that the dog can eat it. Repeat this three times and then on the fourth go, see if your dog will touch your hand without a treat in your fingers. Mark the nose touching your hand and reward the dog from your other hand. When you present your hand for the dog to touch, this becomes your visual cue. Activities. It is possible to take part in other activities, even with a deaf dog. Remember the principles of training are exactly the same, we just need to tweak them slightly to help our dogs learn and understand. I have done many different things with my two, including scent work, hoopers, basic obedience, parkour and running behind a carriage, so training to become a carriage dog. Well, they are Dalmatians. Here is a short clip of Holly training with a pony and carriage. All the information I've gone through today, plus much, much more, is in a book that I have actually written to help owners train their deaf dogs. How do I get my deaf dog to listen through the eyes of an owner and dog trainer? Don't be put off though if you do not have a deaf dog, as my book can even help you with a dog that can hear. It is available on Amazon, worldwide, in an ebook and paperback formats. The QR code will take you straight to the Amazon page to purchase the book. But hang on, wait, we've got a special offer on the way. My special offer is, I have a limited time offer and only a limited number of copies of a paperback available at this great price. This book could be yours for £15 plus postage and packaging, which is a saving of £5 on the retail price and a small postage fee of just £2.85, meaning this book could be coming to your door for only £17.85. But be quick, as I said, this is a limited time deal and there are only a certain amount of copies available at this special price. Contact me before the offer ends on Friday the 10th of February via my email address training at aol.com But be quick, as I am sure you won't want to miss out on this great offer because when they're gone, they have gone. If you would like to know some more information about training, whether your dog is deaf or not, then you can visit my website which is www.onepawforwarddogtraining.co.uk or you can scan the QR code, which will send you straight to my homepage, which will give you more information about all the services that I can provide. 
Email oneporeforward.training at AOL.com or phone me on 07833 013 793. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining me tonight and I hope that I've give, provided you with some further information to help with your a deaf dog or not maybe deaf, maybe your normal hearing dogs. Um, please feel free to ask for any questions and I will do my best to answer them. Wonderful, thank you Faye, that was great. You're welcome. Lots and lots to learn there. Um, so can I ask... Are all your dogs deaf or two? So basically the fact that I had two Dalmatians before, uh, one at 11 months old and then one at eight years old, uh, obviously got hooked to the breed um, and then obviously got Ollie. And then when I first got him, wasn't expecting him to be deaf. So, you know, before I became a dog trainer, before you get educated, before everything like that, you just fall in love with them and just take them home. Um, so it's like, I didn't realise he was deaf, and that's basically the you know our story together. So, and and how many do you have now? Just him? Just two. So I've got uh, Holly and Ollie. So I've got the two of them. So yeah. So um, Holly came Valentine's Day in twenty twenty. So just before sort of lockdown with COVID and everything. So she okay. was about six seven, I think, when we got her. So yeah. And she's deaf too. She's deaf as well. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. And and did her owners, do you know a bit about her background, whether she'd had much training as a so deaf dog or? She, she'd she been probably a couple of homes beforehand. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether her, uh, sort of from puppyhood, whether she was, um, whether her owner had passed away. Um, and so mm. obviously somebody then took it on as an emergency. Um, and then that's that's how we got her. So, but I'm not sure on her her background at all okay yeah yeah it's just interesting isn't it because i remember growing up great danes were always the ones that are often um deaf as well um yeah. and and going to school with someone with a deaf great dane and kind of you know it just being this thing where it was just one of those things that happened and they're a, a breed that's quite susceptible to deafness a bit like to, Dalmatians, right? Yeah, to be honest, there are quite a lot of uh, different bees that are actually susceptible to deafness as well. Um, and it can be surprising how many they are, but it's, um, if you're thinking of obviously the white coat gene, the other ones, white boxers and things like that as well. Um, mm. And obviously um, merles as well can suffer from deafness. Yeah. Oh, well, you've done a great job with them anyway. Do you, you yeah, enjoy working? Like you enjoy oh, yeah, working with deaf dogs now? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, yeah, so it's so rewarding. Lovely. All right, well, we've just got a few comments, so bring them up. Um, Rachel just said, thanks, Faye. It's great to see that training a deaf dog is similar to a hearing dog. Just obviously your use of a visual marker and cues. Great information. Thank you. I thought it was really nice how you made it very human in that, Oh, I had to think of cues and, and we tend to be a bit like that sometimes when we teach yeah. new things with verbal cues. Never yeah. mind having to think of a hand signal for hand it. That yeah. and, and, and also, what does it look like for the dog versus what does it look like for you? Yes. Yeah. And the practicalities, you know, if you've got um, a, for example, a, a lead in your hand and you've got, you know, a couple of treats as well, you, you know, you, you've sort of like limited yourself on how you can sort of progress anyway so yeah so it's just the fact that I, I used to practice without the dog i used to have the lead i used to have treats i used to and think how am i going to you know supposed to do this um so yeah so I, a lot of it was through trial and error a lot of it was and do you get clients seeking you out now for deaf dog training a, a couple yeah i do get a couple mm. so, um i I don't exactly advertise myself as just training deaf dogs you know it's like mm. the fact that it, it, it's all dogs in general um obviously on my website the information there obviously explains that i do have you know deaf dogs you know personally sort of thing yeah great um and chris just said that was great thank you Faye. oh thank you chris <laughs> um and just another comment from rachel which was I like to teach hand signals at the same time as dogs can become deaf later on in life. Yeah, that's a really good point, Rachel. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. that. And Many Andrew, reasons for deafness. <laughs> yeah. Andrew just said, thank you, Faye. Yeah, great. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Corinne says she's got an elderly cavalier who came to me as foster. And I bet that that's a 
dot 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 <laughs> and she stayed <laughs> elderly death cavalier oh. yeah exactly oh all right great well um thanks everybody for coming this evening i thought that was a really thorough presentation so i think people have taken on so much information from that lots to digest and don't forget you guys can always come back and watch these later they're at the moment they're under the live tab on the facebook or youtube pages um but later on we'll we'll edit them down a little bit um just to let you know tomorrow we're being joined by jerry moss and jerry is coming to talk to us about man trailing so that's the little lineup for six o'clock tomorrow um is there anything you want to add before we finish up faye um, only if you were interested in my book, if you can see it, I'm not for sure. It's it's quite a big chunky book, so it's quite mm. a bit on there. Um, and it's basically a lot of information that I've put in there. So if you are interested, it's basically my story with obviously Ollie and everything like that of our journey together. So and there is towards the back and everything. If I can find them upside down. Some hand signals and everything. <laughs> so if you are struggling like I did, I've obviously put some some things in there for you. Great, and that's on your website, isn't it? That's on website, yes, yeah. But if you want want it as a special offer, then then email me. Okay, great. All right. Well, phase details are in the description for the post anyway. So if it if you want to go there, you'll be able to find our information. Thank you so much, Faye. Um, and welcome. have a lovely Saturday night, everyone. And hopefully I'll see some of you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Bye for now. <laughs>